Hi and welcome to Bits from my personal collection, the show where I dig into the time, the developers, and the technology behind some of the items in my collection. Today we'll be taking a look at the adventure game genre, and how it evolved from the simple text-only games of the 70s to the multi-million dollar productions of the mid to late 90s. It's the story of how more than 40 years of great storytellers and innovative people alongside technological advancements would herald the genre. In this part one of two, we'll be focusing on the early years from 1976 to 1985. While action games were all the rage in the latter part of the 70s, with arcade games and home video consoles being accessible and widely popular, the advent of a unique game would herald a new genre that essentially would leave behind the fast-paced action and quick reflexes for a more slow-paced experience with a focus on exploration and story. In 1976, Will Crowther, a programmer and avid cave explorer, would put his finishing touches on his new game Colossal Cave Adventure, programmed in Fortran on Bolt, Baranek and Newman's PDP-10 timesharing mainframe in Boston. While Crowther considered his game finished and went on vacation, other people spotted it, and soon the game was on mainframes all across the US. Colossal Cave consisted of over 60 different rooms, all with text descriptions and a nearly 200-word vocabulary. It was text only and was controlled by entering different one or two word commands. The game required around 300 kilobytes of memory to run, a substantial amount and miles from what was possible outside the realm of mainframes and mini computers. Colossal Cave would become the very first computer game to be categorized as an adventure game and is now considered one of the single most important titles in gaming history. The game was greatly expanded upon in 1977 by Stanford graduate student and programmer Don Woods, with double as many rooms and added fantasy-related elements. Colossal Cave would go on to have a profound effect on nearly everybody experiencing it and greatly influenced the early personal computer game industry. With the release of the second generation of personal computers in 1977, the genre finally had the means to leave behind mainframes and mini-computers and gradually start moving into people's homes. The very first home computer adventure game was developed by Scott Adams in 1978 with his title Adventureland, a somewhat comparable but scaled-down version of Colossal Cave. Adams had as early as 1975 written his first game, a graphical action game similar to Space War, on his brother's 16-bit home-built computer. Inspired by his time playing Crowther and Wood's Colossal Cave, combined with his love for science fiction and his experience writing compilers, Adams sat out creating an adventure interpreter in BASIC on his 16KB TRS-80 Model 1 computer. The interpreter would not only provide the compression needed to fit the game into the limited computer, but also allowed for the development of new titles using the same framework. After six months of work and testing, Adventureland was complete. Initially it was published in 1978 and 79 by TRS-80 Software Exchange and Creative Computing Software Label. But with a handful of new titles developed by Adams throughout 78 and 79, sales were increasing, and retailers soon contacted Adams directly for wholesales. This led Adams, in the autumn of 1979, to move his operation from his spare bedroom to a small retail location and establish Adventure International, together with his wife Alexis. From here on the company, would publish Adams titles, becoming the first game company to primarily focus on adventure games. Over the course of the next few years Adventure International would release a dozen adventure games all similar to Adventureland, but with different settings. From 1982 the titles were re-released with graphics as Scott Adams' Graphic Adventures, also known as the Saga titles. Adams' first titles proved successful and confirmed that there indeed was a market for text adventure games for the personal computer. His titles would, like Colossal Cave, become a huge inspiration for developers and games to come. While Adams was designing Adventureland, a small group of programmers from MIT, consisting of Tim Anderson, Mark Blank, Bruce Daniels, and Dave Liebling, was working on their own and far more ambitious variation of Colossal Cave. The game would be called Zork, and was developed on MIT's PDP-10 mainframe, using the MDL programming language. MDL provided much more powerful string manipulation. Consequently, Zork featured not only more intricate puzzles, but also a much more complex text parser. The word Zork, a nonsense word, was used by MIT hackers as the alias for an unfinished program, and fits perfectly, since the game was developed in multiple stages over the course of a three-year period, with the last edition made in 1979. 
When completed the game took up a full megabyte. No need to say that a game of this size was impossible for any personal computer to handle. When the game later was made available for commercial sale, it was split into three parts. In the summer of 1979, three of the original creators of Zork and seven other MIT alumni and professors established Infocom. Zork was licensed to Personal Software which published the first part in 1980 for the TRS-80 and later the Apple II. These became known as Barbarian Zork because of the cover art, which didn't quite capture the heart of the game. The first part would be the only Zork published by Personal Software. Infocom unhappy with the lack of support the game got, soon reacquired the rights to the title. It's believed that the TRS-80 version only sold somewhere around 1500 copies. Infocom would go on to re-release the first part of Zork in 1981, with the now iconic bricks and trapdoor logo. Before the end of 1982, Infocom had released all three parts of Zork, all of which would over the course of the next many years, see releases for every thinkable platform on the market and sell a million copies. While Adventureland had proven that adventure games were very much feasible on personal computers and that there indeed was a market for them, the sheer size of the full colossal cave had until now proven impossible to fit in the limited home computers. Microsoft would become the first to accomplish this by utilizing the fairly new and $500 expensive add-on floppy drive for the TRS-80. Microsoft Adventure when released in 1979 would not only be the first time home computer users could experience the full colossal cave, it would also be Microsoft's first ever game and the first product from its newly established consumer products division. While the initial release didn't see much success, not only requiring a substantial 32 kilobytes of memory, but also expensive add-ons to the basic computer, all in all a system able to play Microsoft Adventure, could set you back around $5,000 in today's money. The title was re-released with more success as a launch title, and as the very first commercial game for IBM's new personal computer, the IBM PC when released in August of 1981. When the time came to leave the 70s behind, a young married couple from the greater Los Angeles area would kickstart the new decade, heralding the genre into the mainstream and in the process become the very synonym with the computerized adventure game. So far, games had been the labor of computer literates, made without any noticeable distinction between designer and programmer. Roberta Williams, a stay-at-home mom, would challenge this approach and in the process not only become the first female home computer developer in the US, but also the very catalyst for the first graphic adventure game. Roberta's approach to game development didn't start with what was technically possible, but instead with the most important aspect of all fictional pieces, the story and narrative. Roberta had enthusiastically played Colossal Cave, completed Microsoft Adventure and played every Scott Adams game, all on computer equipment brought home by husband and programmer Ken Williams. As it would turn out the two would become the perfect match for catapulting the genre into new territories. For while Roberta had a vivid imagination and a love and passion for storytelling, Ken had all the technical skill sets to transfer her ideas into digital content. Roberta, greatly inspired by earlier games and Agatha Christie's 1939 detective novel, and then there were none, wrote out a full murder story with drawings to accompany the narrative and settings. All she needed to shift it all into a playable game was Ken's programming skills. Ken who earlier had bought an Apple II with the intent of writing and selling a Fortran compiler through his company online systems, was soon convinced by a keen and very passionate Roberta to join the project. Action and role-playing games had been using graphics for well over a year at the time, but the many locations and relatively complex settings an adventure game would require surely was impossible to fit into the limited personal computers. Roberta, unaffected by whatever was technological thought possible, insisted her game should include pictures. Luckily Ken was a very ambitious and skilled programmer. His ingenious approach was to store Roberta's traced lines as sets of coordinates and let the computer draw the lines in between. With this technique, Ken made it possible for Roberta's high-res adventure to have around 70 drawn screens and still be able to put all of the data on a single floppy disk. After three weeks of hard work, Ken wrote the last bit of assembly code on his Apple II computer. High-res adventure mystery house was complete. After failing to achieve an adequate deal with already established software publisher Programma International, Roberta and Ken decided to publish and sell Mystery House under Ken's online systems label. 
While Ken, equipped with Ziploc bags all packed with floppies and photocopied inserts, personally would distribute the game to the handful of computer stores in the Los Angeles area, Roberta designed a full-page advertisement for Micro Magazine. High Res Adventure Mystery House, when released in May of 1980, became the very first adventure game to include graphics. While crude by today's standard, it was a huge leap forward for the genre. The game quickly became successful, not only for its storytelling, but also for its groundbreaking use of graphics. Mystery House initially sold over 10,000 copies, a daunting number at the time. When it was re-released under the Sierra Venture label, sales would reach 80,000. The couple's next title, The Wizard and the Princess, released for the Apple II, also in 1980, would become the first adventure game with color graphics. The game would later be released for multiple platforms and sell over 60,000 copies. Online Systems was on track to become an industry leader and one of the most successful software companies in the business. In 1981, a sole developer would improve further on the adventure game formula by adding animations and also give the player a third-person perspective, letting the protagonist be a visible part of the game. Castles of Darkness was a simple fantasy adventure game and brainchild of Michael J. Cashin, an early Apple II enthusiast. What started as a technical experiment with the Apple II's memory and how to maximize the use of the relatively small amount to encompass more graphics soon turned into an adventure game. Cashin might have been inspired by Ken and Roberta's early graphic adventures, but with his clever approach to the Apple II's memory and graphics routines, he was able to add simplistic animations to the characters throughout the game. What Castles of Darkness had in technical abilities it was lacking in storytelling. With only a very short backstory and no real unfolding story as you progressed, made it bear the resemblance of a third-person perspective dungeon crawler. The game relied solely on text input for all actions, also when moving the protagonist around from scene to scene, very much in the style of the earliest text-only adventure games. The game was published by The Logical Choice, a small chain of computer stores in Maryland. Here Cashin had met with other hobbyists and enthusiasts, shared the latest discoveries, shown off newly written programs, and discussed technical approaches and solutions. Castles of Darkness was only released for the Apple II and was the only game published by the computer store. It is only believed to have sold a few thousand copies, making it pretty much unknown to the mainstream, which could be the reason why the original King's Quest is commonly referred to as the first animated graphic adventure. With online systems hugely successful high-res adventure titles and only the sky being the limit, Roberta Williams sat out on her biggest and most ambitious project to date. A new game that would cater to the experienced adventure player, a game so big it would be marketed as an interactive movie and take the player months to finish. Work on the sixth and second to last high-res adventure began in 1981. For six months Roberta wrote and mapped out an adventure that would span time and space, the earth and beyond. It would take Roberta and her team of 10 people over a year to develop what would become the biggest home computer game of its time. Timezone would feature over 1300 locations and over 1400 high-res images, with 39 interlocking scenarios and span over 400 million years. The undertaking was massive and so was the game, it would take up both sides of 6 5 and a quarter inch floppies, over 2 megabytes of data. The game would use the proven high-res adventure engine, and like earlier titles, feature static images and a two-word text parser. When Timezone went on sale in March of 1982, it retailed for $100, equivalent to $275 in today's money. The game was the biggest and most expensive computer game to ever have been developed, but only die-hard fans of the genre would spend that kind of money, and paired with the high difficulty level, the title became Online System's first high-profile flop. While Timezone didn't bring any innovations to the adventure game genre, its development did. Timezone took game development from the jack of all trades, where a sole developer or small team would do all the work, and move it towards the big studio development model, where games would require a significant amount of specialists to complete, just like we would come to see in the 90s, and today as well. During the third quarter of the 1984 Super Bowl, Apple would introduce its new Macintosh computer to the public. The $1.5 million expensive Ridley Scott TV commercial would go over in history as a masterpiece and as one of the most iconic commercials ever. Two days later, on the 24th of January, the expensive small form factor computer would go on sale. 
The Macintosh featured a built-in high-res monochrome display and came with a radically new graphical user interface, which could be interacted with by the included mouse. William Appleton, a 23-year-old hobbyist programmer, saw the potential and began experimenting using the innovative technology of his new Macintosh. His efforts would lead him to design and develop the first point-and-click adventure game, Enchanted Scepters, in 1984. In 1985 Appleton struck a publishing deal with Macintosh software pioneer Silicon Beach Software, after he had been amazed by the company's first game Airborne, and its use of state-of-the-art digitized sound effects. While Enchanted Scepters would utilize the graphical user interface and the mouse to shortcut command entries, it still required some text input, but the ability to point and click on items, doors and characters to perform actions, would become a game-changer for the genre further down the road. When the golden era of adventure games would arrive in the early 90s with some of the best and most prominent titles, they all would be point and click. Enchanted Scepters had key verbs placed in a pull-down menu alongside shortcuts to navigation, far from as streamlined as the point-and-click adventure games to come. The game didn't become successful, and three other titles were scrapped. The software Appleton had written to help develop Enchanted Scepters would be released by Silicon Beach in 1986 as the standalone game authoring software, World Builder. Silicon Beach would only release five games before focusing solely on productivity software. While Enchanted Scepters quickly faded away, Icom Simulation's 1985 adventure title Deja Vu did not. Deja Vu offered not only a great and interesting storyline, but also a fully point-and-click interface, with all functions on screen at all times. The game was split into different windows with the main window showing the scene. With the mouse, you could drag and drop objects around the scene and into your inventory. Actions were performed by choosing verbs and clicking on items in the main window. Deja Vu spawned the McVenture series of adventure games, which all would take advantage of the Macintosh's graphical user interface and mouse. While both Enchanted Scepters and Deja Vu would give a taste of what the genre would slowly move towards, the text parser-driven games were yet to reach their peak in popularity and success. In 1984 while Appleton was working on his Enchanted Scepters, IBM would, after its initial success with its IBM PC, launch its PC Junior, a take on what should have been an affordable home computer. A year earlier IBM had reached out to the company behind Mystery House, now Sierra Online, asking for them to create a new game that would essentially showcase the upcoming computer's graphic and sound capabilities. Roberta Williams was handed the task by IBM to do something completely different and much more dynamic than what had been seen earlier. With a handful of programmers and artists, they left the aging high-res game engine behind, developed a prototype of their now-famous adventure game interpreter framework, and on an early prototype PC Jr. began work on what would become the first installment in the King's Quest series. 18 months and over $700,000 later, the fairy tale-style story of Sir Graham and the Kingdom of Daventry was complete. King's Quest was a milestone in the adventure game genre. Not only by being fully animated and much more detailed than previous titles, it also featured complete freedom of movement, with the player being able to go nearly anywhere, explore and interact with the environment, bump into obstacles, and go behind things. The game was developed with multiple solutions to its puzzles, allowing players to branch off in different directions, giving the game great replay value. While the story in itself was quite simple, King's Quest was rather large for its time with 48 outdoor and 32 indoor full-color screens. The game indeed bears reminiscence of Castles of Darkness, using an animated protagonist and a third-person perspective, but the advancement in technology the three years separating the two titles clearly shows. King's Quest would utilize the PC Jr.'s 16-color video gate array video adapter, enhanced sound producing capabilities, and all of its 128 kilobytes of memory. At the time the game looked and sounded unparalleled to anything else in the adventure game genre. While the IBM PC Jr. didn't become a success story and was discontinued after only 18 months of disappointing sales, it was turning out to be quite the opposite with King's Quest. Sierra published the game for the PC Jr. in May of 1984. While critically acclaimed and becoming Game of the Month, the poor reception of the PC Jr. subsequently led to disappointing sales. Within a few weeks, the game was released for the IBM PC as a PC booter, accompanied by a more dramatic backstory in the manual. 
A year later in May of 1985, King's Quest was released for the new Tandy 1000 computer, which in essence was similar to that of the PC Junior, but by being fully IBM PC compatible and cheaper, it was way better equipped for a place in the consumer market. The game eventually became a huge commercial success, and basically helped turn a struggling Sierra into a flourishing company. When King's Quest, now with the subtitle, Quest for the Crown, and with an expanded storyline, was re-released in 1987 for the IBM PC and most other major platforms, it would go on to sell hundreds of thousands of copies. The game spawned seven sequels, all designed or co-designed by Roberta Williams, combined they would sell millions of copies, and become Sierra's longest-running and best-selling adventure game series. The framework would be used in Sierra's upcoming and very successful adventure titles, starting with Mark Crow and Scott Murphy's spacefaring janitor Roger Wilco in Space Quest from 1986, Aolo's sleazy leisure suit Larry and Jim Wall's somewhat factual police quest, both from 1987, and Corey and Laurie Ann Cole's fantasy adventure RPG, Quest for Glory from 1989, all of which would spawn numerous sequels throughout the 80s and 90s. In the next part, a new contender will challenge Mighty Sierra, ultimately resulting in some of the best titles in the genre, spawning the golden age of adventure games. Ambitions will skyrocket, alongside production cost, now in the millions, all in the pursuit of the true interactive movie. With the advancement in technology, new genres will arise, and in the process almost completely wipe out the adventure genre. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can also follow me on Twitter or visit my blog at retro365.blog, where I post new articles every month.